By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we bring you round number five of the old school tournament Knights of Thorn in Deventer, the Netherlands. And on the left we have a player playing with the deck. And on the right we have a player playing with Urnum on ice. And before we start with the match, I'd like to give a um, quick explanation about the deck Urnum on Ice and how it works. Urnum on Ice is a white green deck with a splash of blue and it's basically a spin-off of the deck Urnum Genin. Now Urnum Genin is named after two cards. Urnum Jin, the 4-5 uh, Jin from Arabian Nights for 4 mana and Armageddon, the sorcery from Alpha for 1 white and 3 and it destroys all lands in play. Now the idea of Urnum Genin is fairly simple. What you do is early game you play uh, Mana Ramp, for instance the Birds of Paradise, um, you play Savannah Lines, you play some more creatures, and then you play an Urnum Jin. Hopefully because of the Mana Ramp you can play that turn 3, sometimes even turn 2 if you're lucky, maybe even turn 1 if you have the Mox and, and the Black Lotus in place. Uh, but usually, an average game, you can play your Urnum Jin at turn 3. Then at turn 4, you play your Armageddon. And so what, what it does, it, it removes all the land from play. And then you have a more powerful creature, which is the Urnum Jin. It's a 4-5. It's one of the strongest creatures in old school you can have for just 4 mana. Now, um, the deck that we're going to see today is not Urnum Geddon, but it's a spin-off. It's Urnum on Ice. And the big difference uh, with the Urnum on Ice deck is that there are ice storms that are replacing the Armageddon. And the advantage of the ice storm is, first of all, it's one less to cast. So it's one green and two instead of one white and three. Another advantage is that it destroys one land. So it doesn't destroy all the lands. And why is this an advantage? This is an advantage because it makes it always useful to play. So whenever you draw an ice storm, you can think, okay, I'm going to play it. You don't have to think, oh, wait a minute, I'm also destroying my own lands. So do I have enough... Birds of Paradise, do I have my strong creatures on the board? It doesn't matter. So you can play Ice Storm pretty aggressively. And he's playing with four in the deck. So he has a play set of these. And with he, I'm referring to Yoop, who was actually the first player um, that started playing with these Ice Storms instead of Armageddon. So who kind of made this, um, this adaptation of the Urnum Geddon deck and kind of changed it to Urnum on Ice. So another great thing uh, about this deck is that he plays it with four Llanowar Elves, so not with four Birds of Paradise. Um, one of the reasons is that uh, a Llanowar Elf can deal one damage and a Birds of Par Paradise can deal none, so that's an advantage. And um, it does the same job basically as um, as the Birds of Paradise. It just gives you an extra mana so you can ramp. You can get ahead of, of the play of your opponent. You have an extra land, you can ramp. And what it does as well with the Ice Storm is that it gives you a green mana. So Ice Storm, you need at least one green and two to cast. And it allows you to cast an Ice Storm at game uh, at turn two. So if you have a turn one, Lenore Elves, you can have a turn two Ice Storm. So that way you're putting immediate pressure on your opponent and you're taking a huge advantage land-wise because you have two mana more to spend because of the land or elf and the land you just destroyed uh, at your opponent's side. And then when you have an Urnum Jin, you can play out your Urnum Jin the next turn. And the nice thing is Ice Storm is three mana and Urnum Jin is four mana. So that's a really nice kind of build up. So you can have a turn one land or elves, turn two Ice Storm and a turn three Urnum Jin. And basically that's what you hope to have when you're the Urnum on Ice player. Now, another thing that obviously uh, he has added is Blue Power. Now, Blue Power, it's a bit of a no-brainer, and we see it more often. We see uh, people in Dead Guy Ale splashing Blue Power. We see Atog Deck splashing Blue Power. You basically see Blue Power everywhere, um, which, you know, personally, I think it's, it's, you know, it kind of makes games... Kind of look alike more so I, I hope that there are more decks that will be successful without blue power and um, there are some decks that can be successful without blue power so uh, hopefully we can we can see them more and, and getting into the finals uh, but then again I cannot blame anybody for playing blue power because it does make a deck better in most of the cases especially time walk and ancestral recall and ancestral recall is just such a powerhouse and if you have ancestral recall play Ancestral Recall, why not? So um, that being said, the Urnum on Ice is an interesting 
um, spin-off or adaptation, basically, of, of Earn and Geddon. And we're now going to see how it will hold up against the deck. I've seen it holding up pretty well, so I'm, uh, I'm excited to, to see this match. And hopefully we'll have a close game and a fun game. So let's get on to game number one. Game number one of round number five here at the Knights of Thorn Championships. And here we see quite an explosive opening here by the Urnum on Ice player, starting here with an Ancestral Recall, drawing three cards, also playing after that Mox Sapphire, a Lanora Elves there, and a Savannah on the battlefield. So that's a pretty good start here. And what can the deck player who's sitting on the left do? And this is pretty decent. <laughs> Look at this opening. Wow, and that's the big book there hitting the battlefield. And that means that card advantage can begin for the deck player. At least when you're the Urnum and Ice player, you have now one turn without any counter uh, possibilities. And he's using that, uh, that opportunity fully here, taking care of that big book and also playing a Sylvan Library. So look at that. And I must say, after looking at this, I think the Urnum and Ice player is in advantage at this moment. And that Sylvan Library will allow him to kind of get an extra card for free because he just got that those four lives with the Divine Offering uh, because he took care of that book. So that means if he takes an extra card now, he just goes down to 20. And it looks like that's exactly what he's going to do. So he's at 20 life now and has an extra card in hand. And obviously the, the deck player can now play counter spells. So I'm curious what the tactic is going to be. If he's just going to play through it or wait for his options. So he's now casting something for three mana. And that's an Ice Storm. And there's no counter spell. So there is the famous Ice Storm that we talked about in the introduction. And here is a Lightning Bolt on the Lanor Elf at the end of turn. And there's an Underground Sea. And there's an attack from the Mistress Factory, but a quick... Swords to Plowsiers there, so that's two life gained for the uh, the deck player. And he's taking another extra card. Look at this. So the Urnum on Ice is not afraid to use that Sylvan Library. And he's now going down to 15. Tapping two. Taking care of that Divine Offering. And there's a Regrowth. And of course, taking back the Ancestral Recall, probably playing the Ancestral Recall or not. I mean, the, the deck player can counter at the moment, so it is risky. Although the deck player is very light with cards in hand, now he's drawing a second card. So he's deciding not to. And this is very interesting. Maybe he likes the idea of, you know, of the idea of having an Ancestral Recall in hand and, and the, the deck player knows it. So as soon as the deck player chooses to counter something, he knows that he's going to get that Ancestral Recall. And here's a Sarah Angel. And things are looking pretty good here for the Urnum on Ice player. That Sarah Angel is looking quite powerful uh, with this board state attacking here. The deck player going on 16, so didn't take any damage yet. And there's an Ancestral Recall. And there's the counter spell. And then, and this is exactly what I talked about. Like he's using that Ancestral Recall in his advantage. Like you're forcing the deck player to keep a counter spell back. And therefore he could play, oh, and there's a Fireball in one of the Sarah Angels. He could play both Sarah Angels without seeing a counter spell on any of them, on any of the two of them. And um, I also really like the aggressive use here of the Sylvan um, because he's getting life back as well. And he's not afraid of just using his life as a tool to draw extra cards. And let's see. There's the If Biff Afrit. That's a 3-3 flyer from uh, the Arabian Knight with a built-in hurricane. And that's bad news here for the, the deck player because he's on 10 and the Urnum on Ice player is on 12. So that means that he can just start using the hurricane effect from the If Biff Afrit. And I believe it could be over already in this turn. Attacking here for nine in total. And then he activates it. And yes, that's the first game. So, wow. Okay, that was very explosive here from the Urnum on Ice player. Really drawing the right cards at the right time and making the right decisions. And it was very difficult for the, for the deck player here to 
um, get that control going. And that's what you want to do as a deck player. You want to have that control even after that really cool first turn playing that big book with those three mocks. And so looking forward to go to game number two. We're going to let these players sideboard and then we'll see you back at game number two. Game number two with the, the deck player on the play here. I'm curious to see what's going to happen. And there's, oh, that's a nice start from the deck player, Library of Alexandria. And let's see if the Urnum player can find those Ice Storms, because that's what you need right now. Playing a Mox Sapphire and a Tropical Island, passing turn here, and there's that first extra card from that library. And there's a Mishra's Factory. Tapping for three. Oh, interesting here. After sideboarding, playing the Energy Flux, and of course I was thinking about um, about a Night Storm, seeing those three lands getting tapped, didn't get there. The interesting thing here of this play is that, of course, the Urnum player um, has a Mox Sapphire that he needs to pay for, but it doesn't matter, it gets disenchanted fairly quickly. And there is the Ice Storm, taking care of the Library of Alexandria, but the deck player at least got two cards out of it, so that's pretty good. Having some card advantage here, playing that Mishra's Factory. And things are looking pretty even at the moment. And it looks like the Urnum on Ice player cannot find any land. At least it can find the Lanower Elf, creating that extra mana next turn. And then allowing him to possibly play an Urnum Jin. And passing turn now. And we see an Ancestral Recall, probably played at the end of turn. That's usually the way to go. And no, for a moment there I thought he wanted to play another uh, spell, maybe a Lightning Bolt end of turn, deciding not to. Playing a Mox Jet, playing a Soul Ring. And let's see what he can do next. Thinking about attacking, not attacking, attacking, no, tapping it for mana, actually playing an Abyss. And that's quite nice because that takes care of the majority of the creature base here of the Urnamon Ice player. I don't believe he plays any artifact creatures. Of course he has the Mishra's Factories. Drawing a Savannah, so he has four land now. Let's see what he can do. Playing an Energy Flux. Interesting, because now he has to make a decision. Am I going to pay here for my Mox Jet and my Soul Ring? Or what am I going to do? So paying two, so the Soul Ring is paying for itself and he's letting the Mox Jet die going to the graveyard. And of course, the Urnum player will have to make the same decision next turn. Like, does he want to keep the Mox Sapphire or not? Because that's going to cost an extra land. And it's interesting, he's discarding actually, so he's discarding that book so he cannot find any mana. And because of that energy flux, he cannot use the mana of the Soul Ring. So despite having a full hand, he cannot do anything at the moment. Of course, he can counter as well, having those having the City of Brass and the Volcanic Island on the board. And let's see what the Urnum on Ice player can do, playing another land, deciding to save the Mox Sapphire. And in a way, he's also blocking himself now, not being able to play out a Sarah Angel. There is a regrowth, probably taking back the Ancestral Recall. No, this is interesting. Playing the Library of Alexandria, having the seven cards in hand, which is probably the best decision. No. Or is he changing his mind? Oh, he wants to... Ah, now I see. The Urnum player says I want to respond on that play, and he does that by disenchanting the Abyss, and uh, that he did that because the, the deck player was unable to counter not having those two spells. And this is an interesting regrowth here as well, and regrowing an Ice Storm playing an Ice Storm. And it went very quickly, but it meant that the Mox Sapphire, that he couldn't pay for the Mox Sapphire, so he lost the Mox Sapphire. Um, but as you can see, he played the Mox Emerald, the green Mox there, in its place. And that's the nice thing about a Mox. It's zero mana, it's an artifact, so you have an instant extra mana to spend there. Very interesting game so far. And look at it, he's discarding the Fireball. Interesting. So he wants to keep his counter mana open. He'd rather have something to counter than playing his Fireball. Makes sense, because you can only do, in this state, three damage at the moment. And playing a Whirling Dervish. And Whirling Dervish can become a problem very quickly. But there is a Swords to Plows here on the Whirling Dervish. 
And you can see the deck player is really trying to play in a way that um, he still has access to his counter spells, which is, I believe, the way you need to play the deck. And there is an Urn and Jin here. I can see, yeah. Or a counter spell or a swords. In this case, a mana drain, giving him four extra mana to spend. If he has a brain geyser now, that would be quite brilliant. And tapping exactly there's a brain geyser. And these like these type of players always have the brain geyser at the right time because they know how to play with the deck. It's as simple as that. They're waiting for their for the perfect opportunity. Playing that second blue source, meaning that he can counter now as well. Playing a Black Lotus. Probably has to discard some cards here. And you can see him doing that, believing he had to discard two cards. And this is difficult. And the Black Lotus is not ideal with the Energy Flux on the board. I was kind of expecting a Disenchant on the Flux. And is he going to pay for the Lotus or not? So he's going to put, pay for the Black Lotus, drawing a card here. Playing another Mishra's Factory. Very interesting game so far. Passing turn. Playing the Argovian Pixies, the 2-1 creature that cannot be blocked by artifacts. And the 2-1 creature from the Antiquities that works so well against those Mistress Factories. And I think that's the reason why uh, he's playing them. And he's getting two life now after that Swords. So, I mean, it is soaking up a Swords. I always find that funny that at a certain point in old school, it doesn't really matter what creature you play, you just know it's going to get a Swords to Plows here. Oh, a Mind Twist. Very powerful card. And he's losing the balance, and that's not great because that balance is a great answer, actually, to a Mind Twist. And he's starting to attack now. And that's, that's a nice thing about, or the difficult thing when you're playing the deck, you have to be patient. You have to wait until you have that control. And I, I think this player is doing that brilliantly. He's just taking his time. It's like, okay, I, I haven't dealt any damage yet. I don't care. I first want to have complete control and the damage will come later. And you can kind of see that happening right now. And there's the Mishra's Factory. I'm curious to see if he's gonna attack now. And he decides not to, because I was thinking maybe he wants to trade because the Factory still had summoning sick sickness on the side of the Urnum player. He's doing it now, so he probably has something up his sleeve. And there it is. There's a sword stepping it quickly for that extra life gain. So he gains one extra life after the two points are deducted from the Mishra's Factory. Attacking it with the Elf, doing something back. And the deck player, as you can see, is on 15, and the Urnum player is on 15 as well. And there's an Urnum Jin. Probably, exactly, probably there will be a Counterspell, and there's the Counterspell. And an attack here from the elf. What he actually needs is, well, he needs a lot, but what would be nice for the Urnum player is to draw the um, the land that can give it a plus one, plus two. I forgot the name. The green legend land. Maybe you can let me know in the comments below. Uh, there's a disenchant, by the way, here. So a little disenchant battle going on. And the energy flux is gone, meaning there's space now to play the book. And the book can become a really big problem here for the Urnum on Ice player if he allows the book to uh, if he allows the book to stay on the battlefield here. And there's a time walk taking an extra turn, playing a Sarah Angel. I'm kind of expecting a counter spell here. And there's a counter spell. Does cost him two life. Oh, there's a terror actually. Interesting. So he's boarded in terrors because he's playing against such an aggressive creature deck and knowing that his opponent will probably board in more creatures as well. So very interesting sideboard tech here from the, the deck player. And there's a Sylvan Library and there's a counter spell. And at this point it kind of you kind of see that the deck player has all the control. So even though he's now on eight, um, you can see he's countering everything. He's playing terrors, he's playing swords, he's playing disenchants. But there's another creature Drawing a card first and not being able to counter. So this is curious. Will there be a source or something of that matter? 
playing a chaos or probably going to flip here so i'm going to put it on slow and see what what's going to happen in this flip and it's the angel that is going to be flipped on and there it goes it's hard to see actually most of the flip is outside and bam it hits the angel but i don't think it has rotated fully it needs to make a full flip so that means this is a miss so it was on target but it didn't make a full flip you could say it made like a half flip and wow this could be decisive because having that angel against you of course the, the deck player still has the book to get some extra cards looking for solutions also has a full hand here but only on four life and we'll need to take care of that angel let's see what he can do and probably the the sideboard plan of the urn and player was to play interesting there's maybe a copy artifact on the book i think and then there's a balance nice so he's actually surviving here taking care of the creatures probably going to dump some city of brass here only being a four life but what i wanted to say is that the sideboard plan of the urn and player was probably just to put in a lot of creatures and that way kind of play through all that um, removal and counter power of his opponent and then the opponent decides to put in even more creature removal and that way it kind of balances out but these two books here look very powerful for the deck player and there's an instant another sarah angel wow so that's another problem here and what a top deck this is for the urn and player here oh man and if he activates his copied book now then all that can save him is a sword of plowsiers but he's looking through his graveyard maybe he has a recall in hand i mean the deck has a lot of answers that's what what is making uh it's uh, it's so strong and no no this is a win so a win for ernaman ice ernaman ice is winning here zero two and that what an exciting game and what an exciting ending here and uh, that means a zero two uh, victory for Ernam on ice and wow what a matchup and and it's so interesting to see the different choices being being made after sideboarding and they're kind of showing their cards now and you can see that the deck player has boarded in the abyss is boarded in a terror and possibly some more creature hate here and you see the Urnum on Ice player is simply adding three more creatures to the mix and adding some artifact hate and actually taking out all the swords to plows here. So that's quite interesting saying, you know, I'm going to play uh, Disenchant and other things on the Mishra's factories if need be. And of course, having the Ice Storms as well to take care of the factories and deciding, you know what, I'm just going to take out my swords and I'm going to put in some extra artifact hate and some more muscles there to put early pressure on the deck player and um well we have a result here so earn on ice is winning this one zero to two in the fifth round and if you'd like to see more old school magic from this tournament you can click on the videos that are appearing right now on the screen and also keep an eye on the channel because we have one more match um to go and uh, from this specific tournament and it's a top eight match and it's a very close one so i'll probably upload that game somewhere next week so keep an eye on the channel for that top eight match for now thank you for watching this episode of timmy talks the channel where we talk old school magic and see you next time